I'm very happy to have the opportunity to discuss with you uh, the social market economy. So we will go for a discussion about um, the social economic system, not so much the process of the economy, uh, but it's more than just about the social economic system. It's discussing political decisions as well. Uh, political discussions about uh, decisions about welfare and society. I have to apologize that I only can give you a short overview of the social market economy. Normally I need to explain this complicated system of whole semesters. So. <laughs> but uh, as you all are very knowledgeable, so it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, since the consensus of Washington, most economists are giving priority to the discussion of single measures and the economic process, like growth factors, investment strategies, tax, uh, budget questions, monetary aspects, inequality, etc. That is, without doubt, useful and necessary. However, these discussions do not give a clear framework to the economic actors, how to behave in the society, how to behave in the economy, and how to achieve for the individuals and for the society more welfare and more social justice. Rational politics demand not only prudent occasional measures, it needs a clearly defined frame of reference in order to judge whether different decisions lead to a prosperous and sustainable economic development. So in a certain way we have to discuss a lot of points here, but uh, I will restrict myself to some remarks on that and we can go deeper in the discussion after. The social market economy offers such a framework and point of reference, and it has been successfully applied in different countries. Normally nothing is more convincing than success, so it's worth discussing this uh, system. And um, I have researched and lectured in more than 50 countries, and I came to the conviction an analogy to Churchill, that uh, the social market economy is the most perfect of all imperfect systems. But it's far from being perfect. But it combines in a very good idea, in a very good way, the liberal ideas, taking Adam Smith as a representative, and the socialist ideas, taking Karl Marx as a representative. And there is not one model of social market economy. There are different versions in different countries uh, with uh, adapting to the cultural, the social, the economic uh, circumstances. I, I remember two very interesting discussions, for me very interesting discussions. One, when I was a professor in the Catholic University in Chile, where uh, the economic department was dominated by the Chicago boys. And uh, when they asked me to give a course about social market economy, they said, you know that you are talking about a squared circuit, because that can't be, either it is social or it is market, but this combination can't work. Afterwards, about five years later, some of them were in the government of Pinochet, and uh, had the possibility to use their excellent economic knowledge. And they failed with the neoliberal policy in the first three years, and then started to change a little bit towards uh, social market economy. And Chile is one of the examples, of very successful examples, when uh, Pinochet uh, handed over the power, or was sacked, uh, to the democratic parties, Patricia Ivey, the first democratically elected president of the 
first thing he made, he introduced social market economy. So, uh, and the second very interesting uh, discussion, which I remember vividly, is in 91, when the Russian professors, after the perestroika, had to learn market economy. I was invited to give some, some lectures there. And one of the old professors said to me, as looking for an anchor for his old knowledge, was it not Karl Marx who introduced the social thinking into your Germans, social market economy? And he is right in a certain way. So uh, what we can see is that this system uh, has been not developed on the political area, but in the scientific area. Uh, we have the 19th century mainly dominated by economic liberalism until the, the middle of the 19th century. Then the socialist ideas came up after the um, Communist Manifest. The, in those times, very famous Vienna School of Economics tried to adapt parts of the socialist thinking in their analysis, in their economic analysis. And um, Josef Schumpeter is one, one of the most uh, outstanding representatives of that. But uh, there it was. There was a huge political reaction to the socialists from the conservative side. You might remember the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who was a very conservative man, but who was fearing that the political power was going out of his hands due to the increasing power of the socialist movement in Germany. So he invented or he introduced the first social security laws in the 80s and the 90s of the 19th century. Well, partly as well because he wanted to do something for the workers who were living quite miserable uh, circumstances, but mainly politically to take the wind out of the sails of the socialists. So anyway, <laughs> the intention might have been bad, but uh, the effect was positive. Then we had in Germany the war economics, um, First World War, and the democracy was introduced. So there are some professors of the then very famous school in Freiburg, economic school in Freiburg, which called itself Ordo Liberal. It seems to be a contradiction because they wanted to have an economy which is as liberal as possible, but within a clearly defined order. So that meant, for example, free competition, but limits to concentration of the competitive power. That meant that the state or the government shouldn't intervene directly in the economy, but should have watchdogs who, for the government, intervene when it's necessary. We come to this point when we're talking about the competitive system. So this ordo liberal system or concept probably had been condemned to remain in very interesting academic books. Uh, hadn't there not been one of the professors who in 48 became the first minister of economy of Germany? He had all the experience of the First World War, of the war economy of the Nazis, of the total disaster of Germany, and um, he had all the knowledge about the Vienna School, the Freiburg School. So he, although with certain resistance from the German politicians in those times, he introduced a so-called social market economy backed by the American occupying troops. It was not that he could put it in, he needed this force from behind it. And this man, Professor Ludwig Erhard, uh, changed the war economy, changed the monetary system, gave free movement to the trade unions and the employers, 
association because they, according to the system, should negotiate by themselves the labor conditions, labor market conditions. Um, he restricted the government to the production of public goods. He delegated functions which he saw the government never would be able to really fulfill, like the monetary part to the central bank, uh, the watching the competition process to an antitrust uh, association, etc. So these measures to create a new order and to stimulate the competition led to what erroneously is called normally the German Wirtschaftswunder. There was no miracle at all. It was a good concept and hard work. So if we look at the social market economy, it's interesting to compare it with other systems. And you see it in the middle between the centrally planned economy, socialist market economy like we have today in China or Vietnam, and the free market economy by Manchester or neoliberal model now. As you see, the social market economy, which is uh, there put the name social and, and ecological market economy already, I'll come to that later, is an open model. It can move a little bit to the left and to the right. We had a strong uh, movement from the Social Democrats until in the early 60s, being much more in favor of state activity so much more to the left. And then by their so-called Goldsberg program, they said, well, we are going for the social market economy as well. So there is political consensus that this is a model, but how it looks, how it goes more to the left or more to the right are political decisions. Anyway, it has the great advantage of being an open model, which influences from the government, which is declining from the central system to the liberal one, with more individual responsibility, raising from the central plan, centrally planned economy to the free market economy, and a new phenomenon in the civil society, which has the highest influence in this system and rather little influence in the other. So, uh, this is interesting to have this picture in mind in order to see we are discussing here nothing absolute, we are discussing something relative and movable. Now what is this social market economy? It is according to the intellectual discussions an open and flexible system based on workable competition, I don't say free competition, workable competition. That means uh, to avoid concentration of power. And a system with inbuilt social compensation factors based on private property, basically, but this private property cannot be used without limits. It has to take into account the interest of the society. Now, this definition allows us to design very different systems. Uh, and without talking about the basic principles of the systems, the aims of the system, the success conditions of the system, it would be more or less in the air. So let's go first to the basic principles. We have three of them. The first one, individual achievement spirit, personal responsibility. That means everybody has to do the biggest effort possible to care for his own welfare. Now, from George Orwell's Animal Farm, we know that all animals are equal, but some are more equal than the others. <coughs> And therefore, we need a compensation factor, which is the solidarity of the economically stronger persons with the weaker persons, which expresses itself in the social security system, in the tax system, in different uh, issues. 
And sometimes the individual achievement spirit and the solidarity is not enough. So then, and only then, the state should come in as a subsidiary actor. We can discuss afterwards uh, whether it is fine how uh, the different countries do it now. For example, if you take the pension system, which is financed normally in the system a third by the state, a third by the employers, a third by the employed persons. Is that a right combination? Or should the state do more or less? Because the question is, how much subsidiary action of the state can we afford in order not to oppress the solidarity? And how much solidarity can we organize in order not to oppress the achievement spirit of the persons? We all know the system of outsiders mm -hmm. and uh, of people who are yes, just using a generous social system. So how to combine these three elements is the asset test, if you like, whether the system can work or not. So what we need in order to combine these three elements, three basic issues, three basic principles is, first of all, the political awareness. Politicians must know that there is a need of combining these principles. The second is we need absolutely the monitoring of independent scientific institutions who do regularly their analysis. Is this combination right? Has it to change? Uh, you never will find a solution forever. So uh, there you need a, prince, a, a, a process of monitoring by independent scientific institutions. And thirdly, you need democracy. If you don't have democracy, there is no possibility that the population itself can express their opinions about how successful the combination of the principles is by voting in favor or against uh, certain politicians. So this political art obviously depends very much on The goals, we have three goals in the social market economy. Uh, first, the economic aim, obviously. And this aim is welfare for all. Now, you might say it's an illusion, but at least you can strive to. And this is the title of the main publication of Ludwig Erhard, who wanted to establish a system which gives the possibility of welfare for all, and the instruments to reach us are known, innovation and growth, financial stability, full employment, balanced foreign trade. The second aim is the social justice. It is thinking not only in the individuals, and we all know that social justice from our personal point is a relative point. We compare it with our neighbors, we compare it with the time before or later, our aspirations. So you need a certain uh, answer from the society as well. And the best way in the social market economy countries, which has been found, was open access to education. A preventive social policy, social security policy. The social care, if you can't prevent certain social problems. And ethical behavior of the entrepreneurs, of the individuals. So uh, we can talk long about these instruments, how to reach it and how to design it. But uh, there you have in the uh, box of instruments. And since the 80s, the ecological aim was introduced into the system. So uh, this is about reduction of emissions, recycling, uh, renewable energies, saving energies, an aim which has its difficulties as well in it, but it is necessary and in a certain sense we shouldn't talk 
more about the social market economy, we should talk more about the social and ecological market economy. But the ecology is so much in favor of the society that we can stand for the moment with this term. These goals can't be reached very easily. And you need certain conditions that the system can reach, can achieve the goals, the three goals, economic, social, and ecological. Without democracy, it won't be possible. So this is a very crucial point. And democracy obviously linked with internal security. When I was lecturing in Iraq and Lebanon, he said, well, what should we do? If there is no internal security, how can you expect that the uh, entrepreneurs invest on the long run? And uh, how can you expect that uh, the ethical behavior of the people is correct? You need a very clear and reliable political and legal framework that means in a certain way, some political stability, however you define it. You need a strong state which regulates the important sectors of the economy. You need independent media which can inform the population on a broader sense. So uh, what we have done in several countries was to try to introduce to many journalists the economic knowledge because normally in many countries you have quite good journalists but nothing of knowledge of the economy. You need social partnership between the trade unions and the employers associations. You need an independence of the different actors <coughs> in the game and their willingness of compromise because no one can get 100% of its aims without violating the interests of another one. And if they are convinced, and that should be the case in the social market economy, that these five factors need each other for the game as a whole to be successful. It's clear the state activity in the entrepreneurial federations the trade unions, autonomous public institutions are institutions like central bank, like regulatory offices, etc., and the civil society. Now, these actors uh, have their concrete functions, uh, which are known, <coughs> what the government has to do, the nurse have to do, what the unions have to do, the civil society have to do. I've often been asked here in, in Ireland, what about the trade union movement? And I find it's fantastic that it exists, but it is much too much split up. So if it's not strong and organized on, let's say, sectors, uh, it will be very difficult that it really has the power which is, need, it is needed in order to make a countervailing power for the uh, nearly economy-oriented uh, parts. So uh, these functions have to be designed as well and have to be applied in the different areas of the political, economic, and social and uh, ecological activities. Now, only for that to discuss the three principles self-reliance, solidarity and subsidiarity the goals, economic social, ecological in these sectors would take us much time and therefore in order to obey time discipline I have just selected three of these areas the fiscal system the competitive system and the social policy. So, some words about the fiscal policy. Uh, the fiscal policy is very often only considered as a measure of 
uh, procuring the necessary financial means for the state. But it's probably one of the most important factors for social security, social justice, growth, invention, innovation, and other factors. Now, how should that system be defined? And I just take one example of the income tax. You have in many countries the discussion, come on now. How can we get that? It's missing on the hard copy as well, so it must is be. It? It must no, be it's 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 on the stick it is. Does it help? It? <laughs> well, you know the three, three alternatives. You have the flat rate, which is obviously the less social just system. You have uh, the progressive system, uh, and you have the degressive system, and a linear system. Now in the social market economy, the progressive system is preferred because we think that Again, with political decisions, if we find an ideal point from where on you have to pay interest, uh, taxes, and how much up can you go with the tax rates? These are questions which have an immediately effect on social justice as on incentives for innovation and growth. I remember the times in the 60s when the, when the Swedish still had an income tax uh, um, rate of 75%. And I don't know whether you have heard about this uh, famous um, Swedish female writer, Astrid Lindgren, who wrote uh, children stories. And she was very successful, and she had a fantastic essay about the tax system in Sweden. She said, we have a wonderful king, and I'm absolutely willing to give everything of my interest, I income to the king. There is no problem of paying high tax, but I have a problem, because by my income tax, the property tax, and the VAT, I have to pay 105% of taxes. Now, where do I get the 5% Okay, the Swedish afterwards uh, reduced uh, their system as well. But it was interesting that many of the Swedish enterprises looked for alternatives in the continent of Europe and the Central Park. So this is a very important point. Very important point of discussion always has been the direct and indirect tax. Um, the question is, 50%, for example, of direct tax, is it too much? or too little. Remember in Guatemala they had 12% of income tax. And when we were discussing it, I said, why don't you go at least to 25%? They said, that is revolution. The military will be on the streets immediately. So that's a question of education as well, and of awareness of social justice. The same with the indirect tax, especially the VAT. I mean, it's much easier to introduce three points more of VAT than three point more of income tax, politically speaking. So therefore, many governments go for the comfortable way of uh, the indirect tax, and we think that uh, this in the social market economy is not the right way to do it. Now, the question is, should, for example, the central government have all the income tax, all the VAT, and then assign it to the local and regional <coughs> authorities? Or should we have a rule that the central government should not have more than 50% of all these income tax, uh, of, of all these tax incomes? 50% is rather high already. But 50% automatically in the social market economy countries goes to the regional and local authority. So they don't depend financially so much on the decisions of the central government. And we have a much more countervailing power game in political, in, in economic and in social. 
Then the question is, how do we distribute the tax revenue regionally? We know that there are some regions which are richer than the other ones. So a system of compensation between the different regions, if they have their own tax income, is a necessity. So financial compensation between different regional institutions and uh, different, different actors in the economy is a need for the social market economy. We have the uh, demand of a balanced budget. I think that the 3% of uh, deficit and the 60% of debt which we have agreed and mastered is a soft lending. I think it's much too generous, and it should be much stricter. <coughs> uh, so the problems really in this area are how can we combine the tax system in a way that we get enough incentives for the economy, and how can we get enough equality in the economy and in the society. Um, I hope you don't expect that I answer this question now in here. A second point is the competitive system. As I said, we are talking in the social market economy not about free competition, but about a workable com competition. That means that we should maintain the positive functions of, competi of, of competition, competition in order to avoid uh, that the economic power and by concentration of capital will uh, reduce these positive factors. It's interesting that um, uh, Piketty now has taken up some Marx ideas about the capital accumulation and uh, he will talk in, in the Task Sorry. International Conference in 20th of June. What he says, I think Marx said it already, and it seems to be clear if we see today how much the concentration of capital in comparison to the income by, by, by the working class has accumulated, that there is obviously a tendency within the capitalist groups to accumulate more and more. And if the state doesn't go against it, regulate it, keeping the markets open, having a lot of communication about what's going on, watching the competitive power, having consumer protect protection uh, institutions, uh, having ecological protection institutions. All these are forming a countervailing power which is much more effective than the goodwill of any politicians. I mean, talking about the divine dictator, but have we found one? Might be in Bhutan, where they have established an economy of felicity, uh, and they have a very nice king, but Bhutan, smallish. So uh, this is really a very important point for the progress, progressive uh, economy to have these points now, but, uh, and it's not only that the state is uh, reducing the power in, in the competitive uh, game. He has a positive role at, as well by uh, the subsidies for startup companies, subsidies for innovation and research, which give the possibility uh, for some competitors to get into the market and use the open market access. A very interesting case in this field is the privatization. Uh, in Germany, the Nazis had concentrated the economy totally on the military parts and the heavy industry. So one of the first things of Ludwig Erhard was to uh, liberalize, liberalize that and, and uh, privatize it. And one of the most famous cases was Volkswagen. Volkswagen was a state-owned enterprise. And uh, they decided to privatize it. But how? They said, OK, we uh, privatize only a third of the company and keep two thirds for the moment. And stay. But 
these third which we privatize we give priority to those who have an income of not more than let's say for example thousand euro a month they can buy three shares to a reduced price now the price of Volkswagen I in those times uh, was an apprentice in Shell and had a very low income under 50 Deutsche Mark or something like that so I was able to buy the three shares therefore I know the system very well and the shares who had been edited by a value of 200 and went up to 1300 so the government declared first of all we want to have a broader distribution of shares because property is important for uh, the social market economy but we want to give a privilege or uh, priority to those who have low income now you can sell these shares but then you have to pay back a quarter to the government or you can keep them as a stock of shares where you might that. So there you have a typical case that the social awareness that you have to do something to distribute uh, the property in a more equal way um, has been a very interesting case which has been repeated afterwards in, in many uh, privatization processes. Now the problem today of uh, the competitive system is that uh, we have much bigger markets, the EU, the world market, globalization. Um, in Germany, for example, you have the rule that if one government has 25% of uh, the market share, let's say, for example, in producing uh, computers, then they can't buy another enterprise of the same sector without the, uh, the, uh, the permission of the government is the antitrust uh, institution. Now having today 25% of the German market, what does that mean in the EU? And what does that mean on the world level? So it could be that the rules which had been valid for the national economy are to be changed due to the globalization and to uh, raise the competitiveness in the globalization process. So we are in a problem, how to define the market power, the competitive power today with bigger markets. It's very easy in a closed economy. In an open economy, it's quite difficult to define it and you need the sense of how to do it. Now, the most discussed and probably problematic aspect of the social market economy area is the social policy. The aim is very clear. One wants to prevent social problems before they arise. And that, we find the best system is investment in education and professional training. You might have heard, there was a discussion in, in, in Ireland as well, about the system, the so-called dual system in Germany. You have an apprentice who is working four days in the enterprise and goes one day to the professional school at the same time. So that means for the enterprises, they know they're good people on time and can employ them, or if they are not good enough, they don't have to employ them. The second is that the apprentices know exactly what's expecting to them in practical work. And above all, there's a high social prestige for this type of dual uh, professional capacity. So it's not that everybody has to go to the university. And even people, uh, pupils who finish, let's say, at the age of 16 school and go into an apprenticeship possibility, they have, if they are successful in that, afterwards the possibility to go to a third level education like the ITs or something like that. So this dual system, I think, is one of the stabilizing factors not only in terms of social justice, but in terms of preventing social problems as well. As I said before, uh, it's not enough that everybody does uh, the most for his own education and professional capacity. He needs the solidarity 
of the others and the subsidiary contribution and you have this combination in a very good way in this so-called dual system. Again, we have a huge problem now in comparison to when this, this system was established for the first time, which is the demographic change, aging society, which is migration from other parts, which is uh, uh, the high charges which you have in the social security system. So uh, there's a lot of discussion about the social justice in the social security system. Is it still uh, viable as it was before? Should we change it? Should the state pay more into the system than the third, for example? Is it necessary to reduce the pension level in general? I must say, when I came to Ireland 10 years ago, I was amazed about the pension level here in Ireland compared to Germany. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's good for you. It's not good for me that I have a German pension, but anyway. Uh, so we have here problems as well and not have found the ideal solution for the long term. You remember that uh, Gerhard Schröder, Social Democratic uh, Chancellor, uh, was going with Tony Blair uh, in the 90s towards a third way, well, whatever third means. I mean, social market economy has a concept which says something about the word social and market, but third way could be everything. So he was tending, although he was a social democrat, towards the neoliberal system. The economy was close to collapse, the social system was close to collapse, then he made his famous Agenda 2010. Reforming the social system, social security system, for example, increasing the age of pensions from 65 to 67, uh, and a lot of, of other things. The German population wasn't very thankful for it. They elected Angela Merkel instead of Schröder. Now, she is benefiting enormously from Schroeder's Agenda 2010, but uh, this is, seems to be a problem for politicians when they are coming with a real strong reform, but the benefit normally goes <laughs> to the opposition. Anyway, we have a, a relatively clear uh, system now, but we are in front of challenges. And this is the problem of the social market economy. You never are in a perfect situation, and therefore you need really a watching system which normally only can do the academia. And I don't mean by academia only the universities. I mean research institutes of the government, of, of, of the trade unions. I mean research institutes of the employers' associations, so that we really get a game of countervailing power and different information. We have every year a so-called uh, report on the economic performance in Germany, which is done by a group of experts, uh, scientific experts, financed by the state. And they normally come with a critical view of what has happened and what has gone wrong. So we have this very funny situation in the television because they present their reform in front of the television and uh, on the other side, you have the Chancellor, the Minister of Finance, Minister of Economy. And you see the smiling faces of the scientific persons that they have found so many things, and the sour faces of the politicians. <laughs> but the population is enjoying this, because they know at least it's what Are they right or not is not the question. But that there is a countervailing power uh, and watching what's going on. And they obviously... Uh, have to make international comparisons as well to see how is it going in other countries. Is the model still valid for the country? They have to advise the government and they have to prepare the future decision makers. Uh, so I think we can't talk enough about the role of academy or academia in monitoring the uh, social market economy. As I said before, it's possibly the most perfect of all imperfect system, and it's far away to be perfect. And it's not perfect, it can't be perfect because the challenging 
challenges are changing. And the challenges which we have at the moment is in general globalization. I don't believe that uh, what Piketty said that there might be a tendency back to nationalization of the economy. I think globalization will probably go on. So we have to compare in what situation are we. We have international agreements, we have integrational processes with the EU and, and others. And you see what they are talking in Europe now with the free trade agreement with the United States. There might be another challenge. We have the environmental pro uh, protection challenges from Kyoto onwards with all the following uh, decisions. We have the demographic changes. And what we need probably, and we have probably too little, although it's starting, is the discussion of the values in the economy, in the society, in the part of ecology. So I think that uh, it's an interesting and complicated system, uh, but which needs much more uh, discussion still in order to keep it on the successful, successful way it has been in different countries in Europe and Latin America. In Asia, there is more reluctance due to cultural problems, although Vietnam is clearly on the way too, having learned from China, which they have over overlooked. So it's interesting to observe it internationally, how it's going. And so thank you very much for your time.